when I told him about this series, I think he's like, the Guns N' Roses sings a song named Patience, and then he listened to it, and he said, do I have to whistle? I said, you better believe you do. <laughs> he's been practicing. I've been sitting in my office working on a message here, whistling going on, you know. Man, welcome. My name is Jacob. It's such an honor to have you here. If we haven't had a chance to meet, can I tell you, you're in a special place, and it has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with me at all. It's a special place because of the way that God's on the move in this house, and it's such an honor that you would spend a little bit of your week with us. It's a snob-free church where we just come to worship, recognizing our faults and failures and the perfection of our Savior. It's why we exist, and we're in this series, Guns and Roses, and I'm not going to give you the entire backdrop, but just to recap, it's a kingdom versus culture series, and we're taking songs from Guns and Roses and talking about how it's kingdom culture versus culture and nature. So week one, we took the song, Welcome to the Jungle. And we talked about how culture wants to drive your life. Culture wants to influence your identity. Culture wants to influence your relationships. Culture wants to influence every single part of your life, the way that you view everything and every decision that you make. So we as believers in Christ, we have to allow kingdom to drive our lives. And we do that by substituting principles of kingdom in place of culture. And we have opportunities to do that when we speak life instead of gossip, when we worship rather than worry. That's instituting kingdom principles over culture. We too, we talked about sweet child of mine and how we have an identity made in the image of God. And the image of God is unchanging, unmatched, unrivaled. And so your image, your identity is unchanging, unmatched, and unrivaled when it is rooted in the image of God, which is powerful because culture is always changing and trying to sell you something new and false. Last week, we talked about knocking on heaven's door and how salvation doesn't just change eternity. Salvation changes our today and the way that we live today and the decisions that we make today. So we run our race, understanding the purpose that God has given us with great perseverance and endurance. And today, obviously, we're talking about the subject matter of patience. Anyone in the house love a good long line. I'm like, you see a good long line, one that you don't, you don't even know why it's taking so long to move, and you think to yourself, I cannot wait to get in the back of that line. I just love to wait in line. Waiting in line is like my favorite thing to do, right? Top of my resume says, patiently waits in lines. The truth is, when we see a circumstance like that, it tests our patience, Amen. right? Right? And, and, and we struggle and we get frustrated. And you're like, what does patience have to do with kingdom versus culture? Well, culture says now, instant, and easy. But the kingdom of God says patient in God's time and hard. Polar opposite sales pitches. And so we have to substitute the kingdom principle of patience for our busy, our rush, our chaotic, if we want to really live in God's purpose and promise for our lives. And as I was preparing this message, man, I was going to talk about patience with God and patience with ourselves and patience with other people and patience with seasons and circumstances. And I had all these places I was going to, I kept writing. And here's the truth. I haven't made it yet past patience with God for the purpose of this message because I want you to be patient with me. And I understand if I preach for five hours, you'll no longer be patient with the message that's being told. So we're going to build on this over the summer, towards the end of the summer. But today, we're just going to talk about the concept of being patient with God. Now, I say that, and for some of you, that sounds like a do what? Like, what are you talking about? Be patient with God. And in no way are we comparing ourselves, uh, putting ourselves on the same playing field as God. But there are times in your life where you have to be patient with God to really walk in his promise and purpose for your life. See, patience is actually defined like this. The capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset. That's a much deeper word when you actually begin to break it down and look at the definition of patience. It's the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering. I don't accept delay, trouble, or suffering overly well if I'm being really honest with you. And if I do accept delay, trouble, or suffering, I certainly don't do it without getting upset or angry. 
You see the twofold nature of the word patience? And patience is actually really important. Scripture mentions patience 70 times, highlighting the fact that patience plays a large role in our ability to be true followers of Christ, to really be committed to him and what he's doing. So when I'm patient with God, what I'm saying is I develop the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, which this world will bring, trouble, which this world will bring, and suffering. And I do that without getting angry or upset. So when I talk about patience with God, I'm talking about the moments when you're really asking God for something. You're believing God for something great. You're you're earnestly seeking him and you're committing your life to the process. You're reading his word. You're fired up. But as time slips and fades and inevitably the delay comes, the trouble comes, the suffering comes, We begin to get angry and upset, oftentimes with God. In these moments, I have this tendency, and maybe you guys don't struggle with this, I have this tendency to feel like, God, like, don't you know what I've done? Don't you know the commitment I've made to you? Don't you know the the sacrifice that I've made to you? And, And I imagine God the Father up there in heaven looking down in the moments when I'm pleading with him about how special and unique I am and all of the things I've done. And I imagine he feels about me kind of like I feel about my kids when they take the trash out and they come in with their chest puffed up like I took the trash out. Yeah, fantastic, man. I went to school for 21 years, passed two bar exams, got a real job to make enough money to save up a down payment to build this house, and I pay the mortgage every month so you can live in it. And you're proud because you took the trash out? (laughs) And I picture God looking down at me whenever I'm getting frustrated and angry and upset with the delay and the suffering and the hardship. And I'm going, man, God, don't, don't you know what I've done? I picture him being like, yeah, I created the world. Mm Hmm. Yeah, I did it, all of it. Good for you, Jacob. Really proud of you there, sport, you know. So when I get frustrated and angry, I have to remember that patience is the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset with God. In Hebrews 6, 11 through 13, we see this beautiful passage. It says this, We want each of you to show this same diligence. Same diligence indicating that there's a model, right? The same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for may be fully realized. There's a model of diligence that this writer in Hebrew is talking about. And he's saying, if you show the same diligence that has been modeled for you, what will happen is that you will fully realize what you have hoped for. Then in verse 12, it says, we do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those, again, there's a model, who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. I want to inherit what God promises me. And so the writer is saying, there's a model for this. There's a model for you to imitate through faith and patience. And then the writer gives us the model in verse 13. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, God swore by himself. So the writer in Hebrew is saying, hey, there's this model. The model is the faith and patience of Abraham. And when you implement that in your life, you will inherit the promises of God. See, one of the challenges to being patient with God is understanding how good God really is. So so the writer is reminding us of promises fulfilled and those that diligently waited with faith and patience for the hope to be fully realized. And so we go all the way back to the book of Genesis to fully reflect upon the story of Abraham. His story unfolds early, early in the days after creation. And I just want to give you a snapshot of Abraham. Abraham's about 70 years old when he leaves an urban city, a place that had stuff and houses and like creature comforts. And he leaves Iran for, and I want you to see this, a land I will show you. 
is what God said to him. I want you to go. I want you to leave it. And then I will show you. Talk about patience. Show me first. Then I'll go. Give it to me first. Then I'll do it. But that's not how God works. I want you to go. And the question is, are you obedient to the go? And do you have patience to see the plan revealed? And I think about the story of Abraham and I think, man, like he leaves. I know that. And so I bet he was out crushing it for God. But in truth, he experienced famine and war. And at the age of around 75, he initially gets a promise of a son and is like, that's not happening. Like my wife's barren and like, bro, I'm 75, okay? I ain't got the patience to be raising a kid in this moment. Abraham, in his impatience, takes matters into his own hands like many of us naturally do. And so he actually does have a child by someone that isn't his wife, a little bit of a boo-boo there along the path, a little bit of a mistake that got him in his impatience. And then at the age of 99, God makes a covenant, a full-blown promise, a covenant, an oath with Abraham. And Isaac, the son of Abraham, was born when Abraham is 100 years old. And now many of you know Abraham from the song, you know, Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. That's good. We whistle and sing. I can't imagine my story with God taking 30 years to begin to unfold. I get frustrated in three hours, 30 minutes, sometimes three minutes. I get impatient and I begin to grumble and get angry and upset at the perceived delay that I have when culture tells me I should have it instant now and easy. But the kingdom of God says patience in God's time and hard. And Abraham is a model of faith and patience and his waiting. And it's not that he didn't have missteps along the way, but he stayed committed to being the father of many nations. And there's two unchanging things about God represented in this passage from Hebrews that I want us to look at that reveal how good God really is. The first thing is God's promise. God makes a promise to Abraham. And you think, like, what's the significance of that? Well, 2 Corinthians 1 and 20 tells us, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. So Paul's writing to the church in Corinth, and he's like, hey, guys, I don't think you understand the infinite ability of God. He can make as many promises as he wants to make. And all of his promises are yes in Christ Jesus. And so through the amen, meaning let it be, as we pray and communicate to God, we're understanding that they're, they're sealed by us to the glory of God. Now, it's really important that we understand that there's a phenomenon occurring in the promises of God because one of the reasons that many of us feel like we're not living in the promises of God is because we misunderstand the promises of God. And therefore, we don't think God is good because we don't feel like we're living in his promises. But God's promises are not about you and I receiving more. God's promises are not about us getting things. God's promises are not about our wants, hopes, and desires. God's promises are about God's glory and for God's glory. And it's just an honor that the creator of the heavens and the earth would choose to work through us. And so here's the kicker to living in God's promises. We have to ask ourselves Have we allowed the glory to shift from us to God? So when you break down what Paul's writing, he's saying, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes. They're yes and amen, as we often say in church. God's promises are yes and amen. When they are committed to God's glory. And the really cool thing is that when God's glory shines through your life, you become a recipient 
of some really good and powerful and cool stuff, but we mistake God for not being a good God when we fall into the cultural lie that God's promises are for our sole benefit. God's promises are for God's glory, for his glory to shine, for his name to be magnified, for him to be lifted up. And it's important that we understand this because the things that we desire, that we wait for, if they aren't of God, are never as sweet as we thought they would be. They're never as meaningful as we thought they would be because they're temporal and they're finite in nature. The second thing I want you to see that confirms God's goodness in this passage in Hebrew is God's oath confirming the promise. It says, when God made his promise to Abraham... Since there was no one greater for God to swear by, God swore by himself. It's really important because ordinarily the swearing of an oath belongs to our fallen human situation in which a person's word is not always trustworthy. It's why when someone gets into court and they're called to testify, they raise their right hand and they swear an oath to tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help them God. Because we understand in the court system that there are a whole lot of liars in the world. We're calling out the inconsistent nature of humanity and humanity's general untrustworthiness, so we have them swear an oath. And the oath can mean something. You know, when I was practicing law, one of the things, the tools that I always kept in my pocket because I tried a lot of cases is that if I was cross-examining someone and it, they were answering the questions really well, occasionally you would just have a tough witness, right? Like they're just kind of going toe-to-toe with you. They've got all the answers. It's not really going the way that you would want. And you're asking question and question and they've got to answer and answer. Finally, I would just stop and I would say, do you appreciate the oath that you swore? Like what does that have to do? I'd wait for them to answer no matter how long it took and then I would remind them That if they violate that oath, it's subject to perjury and imprisonment. Then I would go back to asking my questions. We would use the oath to remind them, hey, this is not the place to be untrustworthy. You swore it because we don't trust you. We inherently don't trust you. See, God's oath was a condescension to human frailty. Thus making his word, which is already in itself absolutely trustworthy, doubly dependable. God doubles down with Abraham. He's like, not only did I say it, I'm going to covenant with you that it will in fact come to pass. Revealing his goodness. So we're to be patient. Meaning what? I mean, we're to have the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset because I know what God says is unfailing and true. So it begs the question, if God is so good, then why do I struggle? Why do I doubt? Even though I believe it can still be difficult, and the answer is found in Scripture, and the answer is patience. See, following God... There's a formula here. Following God equals faith and patience. Faith and patience. Verse 12 told us, We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. There's a secondary element to inheriting the promises of God And we often believe that it's just faith. And if I'm being really honest with you, I'm good at the faith part. I have big dreams and big belief and big vision. And I've seen God show up. And like I just I I believe that God still does miracles, that He's still moving, that He's still giving gifts, He's still operating. I've got big faith, but I struggle with the and patience. If I want to inherit the promises of God, if I want to truly follow God, I have to have faith and patience. I have to have faith, belief in who he is, his character, right? His his goodness and his might and the capacity to accept delay, suffering, hardship without getting angry or upset. 
That's a challenge. That's really difficult. But it's important that we understand it because I can believe in something and forfeit the benefit of the belief through a lack of patience. You ever go on vacation and it's like you've researched, like you know there's a restaurant you want to eat at, right? Like there's that spot, like you, you've read about it, you've read the reviews, you've looked at the menu, like you have all the faith, the belief that this restaurant is going to be absolutely incredible. The service is going to be impeccable. The ambiance is going to be on point. The food is going to change your life. And you get there after a long day on the beach and everybody's sunburnt and tired and you walk up to get a table and they tell you a 90 minute wait. Now, if you're a part of my family, you got to understand when we pull up to this parking lot that has a 90-minute wait, it's already full. So my oldest son, Collier, he's like calculating how long he thinks the wait's going to be and are there any empty spots and how many empty spots there are and how big is the restaurant and how many tables and seats are in the restaurant and based upon the number of empty parking spots, is there any possibility that we're ever going to get in this place and Ava's going to have no clue that we're even at a restaurant or that we're waiting and and Ben's just going to Conor McGregor through that dude shoulder bumping everybody. So once we've gotten past this point, we get up in here, 90-minute wait, we get back in the car, and we go eat some chicken McNuggets. Can I get an amen? Amen. I had all the faith that the restaurant was going to be incredible. I had all the belief, but I didn't receive the benefit of that belief because I lacked the patience to wait for the promise to be fulfilled. Now, how often do we do this with God? It's like he's moving in, he's speaking, and we believe. Like I have all of this faith, but absent the patience, the capacity to accept the delay, the suffering, the hardship without getting angry or upset. Following God is faith and patience. I'll put it to you like this. It takes faith to receive salvation It takes patience to really follow God. So don't forfeit his promise and his glory lacking patience. Okay, so God is good, but why is this still a struggle? Why do I still struggle to be patient with God? We have to understand this kingdom principle. God's time isn't our time. Psalm 90 and 4 says, A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. 2 Peter 3 and 8 says, Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. See, in Acts chapter 17, we learn that at the global level, God sets the times for nations to rise and fall. And at the personal level, Psalm 31 and 15 says, My times are in his hand. Kingdom principle, God's time isn't our time. It's important that we recognize the distinction that we're making. Time as we know it and as we measure it was created by God. They're not the same. My time and his time aren't the same. And when I recognize that, I can still trust his goodness even in delay, even in suffering, even in hardship, without getting angry or upset because I can be patient, that God's time is always right. Hebrews 4 and 16 puts it to us like this. Let us then approach God's throne of grace. Come on. What a, what a statement, right? God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, not with uncertainty, not with doubt, not with frustration, but with great confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I don't know about you, but oftentimes I go to approach God's throne of grace and I lack confidence. 
I'm going to God's throne of grace because I don't feel confident, because I don't feel like enough. And can I just pause for a minute and say thank you, like sincerely, to every single person in this room that serves? You guys are making such a difference in this place. This house doesn't exist and operate because of me or because of my gifts or my ability. It operates because we're one giant army allowing kingdom to come through our lives and fighting the good fight uh, against culture, believing that God is greater and that he is significant. And maybe you're in the room and you're thinking about serving. Can I give you a little bit of insight into how this works? When God calls you to ministry, you're like, ministry? Yeah, see, serving to build the kingdom is ministry. See, driving a golf cart is ministry. Parking in a car, ministry. Brewing coffee, ministry. Serving coffee, ministry. Anything you do, spending time to build God's kingdom is ministry. And when God calls you to ministry, inevitably, the voice of the enemy will try to affect your confidence, let me just explain it to you just on an even more micro level. If you sign up to serve, the first Sunday you go to serve, it will be hell on wheels. Because the enemy is going to do everything he can to break your confidence that you're good enough to go and do this, that you're capable, that you're qualified to serve, to build his kingdom. So I love how Pastor John Piper put it. He says it this way. Prayer is the form of faith that connects us today with the grace that will make us adequate for tomorrow's ministry. Timing really matters. So let me give you a really helpful tool. If you'll pray Saturday for what God wants to use you to do on Sunday, you'll approach the throne of grace with great confidence and he will give you what you need to see his purpose fulfilled through your life when you show up to do his work. But I read a passage like Hebrews 4 and 16, and I can't help but think, man, what if, like, what if grace comes too early or too late? Like, like, what if God's timing doesn't line up with what I need when I need it? Because I have to be really honest with you. There are lots of times when I have approached the throne of grace with great confidence so that I may receive mercy and find grace to help me in my time of need. And it doesn't feel like God helped me in my time of need. And it doesn't feel like he showed up in the way that I wanted him to or expected him to. So I want us to take this passage just one step deeper. The traditional translation of Hebrews 4 and 16 does not make clear a very precious promise that's being made. See, we have to have a more literal rendering to see it. See, the promise is not merely that we find grace to help in time of need, but that the grace is perfectly timed. You say, but didn't you just say that you approached the throne with confidence, seeking the grace? And it, yeah, it didn't necessarily feel like it. It didn't necessarily show up in the way that I expected, but God's time isn't my time. So I am patient. See, God's promises are unfailing, and his timing is perfect. You got to believe both, that his promise is unfailing and that his timing is perfect. And we believe that out of the goodness of God and understanding that God isn't bound by what binds us or limited by what limits us or reduced by what reduces us. And when we put God on our timeline, we are unintentionally misviewing and misunderstanding the might, power, and majesty of God himself. So be patient with God. Accept the delay the suffering, the hardship, without getting angry or upset. Back to the lines that none of us love to wait in, right? Have you ever made the decision, though, that you're going to wait? You showed up at the restaurant that you've just desired, and they tell you it's a 90-minute wait, but you're, just, you're so committed that you're going to wait the full 90 minutes. You're just going to stand in that line. Now, there's two types of people that stand in that line. 
This is the type of person that waits and grumbles and huffs and puffs the entire time. Every time someone else gets a table, they look at each other and say, were they here before us? <laughs> See, that's just called waiting while being a jerk. <laughs> and don't dare walk out of here on Sunday and be that person. I meant that. It wasn't figurative or like a joke. And then there's the person that waits, accepts the delay, without getting angry or upset. And if you're the person that waits without getting angry or upset, you inevitably get seated at your table, and oftentimes you find a wait person that will say, you know what, I know how long you've waited, and I thank you for being patient and being patient with me. And why are you met with that reception? Because we want to be patient with those that are patient with us. I don't know about you, but I really want God to be patient with me because I screw a lot of stuff up and I get a lot of things wrong and I make a lot of mistakes and bad decisions. So I want God to be patient with me. And if I understand the kingdom principle that those that I'm patient with want to be patient with me, then surely I want to be patient with God. Surely I want to be patient with him, understanding that when I'm patient with him, he wants to be patient with me, and that when I'm patient with him, he's patient with me, and he's patient with me, and then I'm patient with him, and then we have this circle of patience that I receive more benefit from than he does. See, God's incredibly patient with us. 2 Peter 3 and 9 illustrates this truth. It says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, As some understand slowness. Again, he's not bound by our time. Instead, the Lord is patient with you. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The Lord is long-suffering with this culture and with this world because he wants as many people to receive the good news of Jesus Christ that can possibly receive it. He wants to see as many people repent and be put back in right relationship with him. Do you see how good God really is? He delays justice so that you and I have opportunity to hear, respond, and repent to the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's patient with me, so I want to be patient with him. And I want to be patient with him, so he'll be patient with me. But we get to this point in our life, and I just wonder if our lack of patience is a result of a false urgency. We use words like busy, rushed, Chaotic, a lot. And I wonder if we feel this way. I'm just having a conversation, not throwing stones at anybody, because it's good for me too. I wonder if we feel this way because we have a false sense of urgency created by culture rather than living in the principles of the kingdom of God. I saw this illustration a few months back when I was in St. Louis and a guy by the name of Pastor Kevin Gerard was speaking to us about leadership and it really moved me and challenged me. And so I was thinking about it. And so, you know, we feel really busy and rushed, but have you ever calculated how many hours you actually have in a week? Don't worry, I did the math. You have 168 168 hours in a week. Now listen, there's some things that we do and are a part of that that may seem like culture, but it's really us taking kingdom to culture. And there are things that we do that are of value. So one of the things that we do is we work, right? Work is actually created by God. It's a good thing to do. The passage actually says don't be lazy, right? Don't be lazy if you want to inherit the promises of God. So let's say that we work 45 hours in a week. That leaves us 123. I gave you a little extra over full time because you got to get to and from work, right? So you have to sleep, right? That's a necessary part. You got to rest. God wants you to rest. He understands that. I'm going to give you eight full hours a night, seven nights a week. Can I get an amen? 
That's good stuff, right? So that leaves me with 67. Now, God created family and he values family. That's why he treats us like family and creates family community known as the local church. And so we want to be really devoted to family. And so I'm going to give you 14 hours a week fully devoted to family. 14 hours a week. That's two hours a day. Like, I'm talking full devoted. I'm not talking like we're breathing the same air. I'm talking committed to each other, right? That's, that's some real family time that we're talking about. That leaves me with 53, okay? So then I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to give you 13 hours a week. 13 hours a week to do recreation, hobbies, to work out, to do all of that stuff, right? And listen, some of you work out, and you work out a lot, but you don't work out 13 hours a week. Maybe you play golf. Listen, this is four rounds of golf, right? Maybe you're a softball player. I think I said earlier, that's 13 games of softball in a week. That's a lot of time when you actually think about it, committed to hobbies and recreation. And so what does that leave us with? 40 hours a week. 40 hours a week after you've worked, You've slept, you've been a great husband and father and wife and son and daughter. You're in shape, you're buffer than you know what to be. You broke 80 in your golf game and you still have 40 hours a week. Is rushed and busy just a false urgency created by culture? A lie told to us to create another distraction? See, I think we have to ask, what are we doing with the 40? How are we spending this 40? And the more I've thought about this 40 hours, and the more we realize that we actually have 40 hours a week to do whatever we want to do, after we've taken care of so many priorities, I wonder if the question needs to change from how much time do I have, or why don't I have enough time, to how am I spending the time that I do have? See, how much of the 40 am I giving to God? How much of the 40 am I fully devoting to Him and His goodness and His kingdom building and His purpose in my life? And what if we took it a step further and our measurement wasn't just how long but how well? How well am I spending the time that I'm spending with God? How well am I serving God? How well am I growing in patience? Am I giving God the last little bit of leftover and saying, I was busy? Just crazy, man, chaos. I've done that. Man, I got soccer practice, and I got this, and I got that, and God, I'll, I'll get to you at 11 o'clock tonight when I'm dog-tired and can't focus or see straight. How well am I spending time with God? It's important that we understand this because spiritual discipline requires time well spent. And spiritual discipline is such a challenge for each and every one of us and one of the major reasons it's a challenge is because, like anything in life, we aren't very good at spiritual disciplines when we first start doing them. You don't feel very good at praying or reading the Bible or meditating on His Word. Or like, you don't feel good at it at first. And so we quit things that we don't feel very good at, but it's why we have to be patient, willing to endure the delay, the suffering, the hardship without complaining or being angry we're getting upset. Spiritual disciplines require time well spent. And it's so important that we understand this as we wrap all of this series up, going back to Matthew 13 and 44, where we started. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought the field. See, the kingdom of God equals a treasure in a field. And what's the treasure? You are. You're God's treasure. You're God's treasure. People. God values people. 
You, right where you are, in all of your mess, mistakes, regrets, past, doesn't matter. God values you. And we know because he sold it all when he sent his son to take on flesh and bone and die on a cross for you and for me so that we could be redeemed back into right relationship with our God. That's how good he is. So I want to be patient with him. And when I learn to be patient with the king, I become patient with the people of his kingdom, which are his purpose. And it's why we exist. And here's what's wild. I don't even think God's asking you to sell it all. I think God's just asking you for a little more and a little better of the 40. I don't want you to leave here today going like, oh man, I just, I got to rearrange my whole life. I got to turn the whole thing up. So no, I want you to leave here today going, how much more of the good 40 could I give to God? Not the leftovers. How much more of the good 40 could I really give to him? You say, I don't have time. Sure you do. You have 40. And culture wants to drive your life. But you have to allow the kingdom to come through you and you have to defend the kingdom by living for God all the time, by devoting yourself to the treasure of the field, which is your purpose. And when you fall in love with the treasure of the field, you'll find yourself patient with God because you'll realize how good he really is and how patient he is with you. Heavenly Father, we thank you. God, we thank you today for your word, for your might. We thank you for your goodness and your joy that abounds in this place. God, we give you praise and honor and thanksgiving for everything that you're doing in and through this body of believers. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, nobody's looking around. Super simple today. But if there's something in your life you're struggling to be patient with, maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's yourself, there's just something. You're struggling to be patient with God, to trust his promises. Would you just slip your hand up? I just want to pray with you real quick, just real quick. God, I thank you for every hand raised. And God, I pray that you speak into this situation. God, I pray that each and every person that raised their hand, that they see your goodness, that they see your promises, that they see your glory shine brightly through their life. God, I pray that they would hunker down and have a willingness to accept the delay, the hardship, and that they would learn to do it without getting angry or upset. God, let them grow in patience, a fruit of your spirit, a fruit of your goodness. Because I genuinely believe that it will unlock so much potential in their life and that that which they hope for will then be realized through faith and patience. We give you praise and honor. It's in Christ's mighty name we pray. And everybody said a great big.